Good morning. It's Pastor Ralph. Good to see you guys. Thank you for joining with us. And we're ready to get right into God's Word. And I always ask if you guys would keep your eyes open and keep your ears hearing and your heart receiving. That is always my prayer whenever I share the Word of God with someone because it takes those three things for you to receive from God, you know, seeing eyes, hearing ears, and an open and receptive heart. And so I thank God for that in Jesus' name that you would receive everything today that you need to hear to walk that walk and talk that talk in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. My message for today is going to be a little bit different, uh, but I want you guys to jot down some notes and uh, we're on the live chat right now. I'm really encouraged when you guys make remarks or comments or ask questions, and that helps me to feel where you're at. You know, sometimes when you're teaching the word, you know, you need the feedback. And so I do appreciate all the feedback and the participation that you guys have done over the past few weeks. And so with all of the things going on in our world today, all the uh, current events and still with the war and uh, with all of the things that are happening, we've been doing a lot of prayer for that. And I'm asking you guys just as a collective to always remember those who are less fortunate, those who are being hurt by the war, those who have lost lives, um, those who are in fear. It's so much going on. I just wish we could all pray and just get along and think we'll be okay. But it's just not that way. You know, when you have evil on this side and then you have uh, people on this side trying to do the right thing, I've always said we need to do God's will and find out what God wants. And I'm sure that God is not asking anybody to kill anybody or to hurt anybody or to destroy anything. In fact, we know that it is the devil's job to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's what he does. And I don't know why men, other than the fact that we're being deceived in these last days, why we think we can have the kind of power that we do over someone else's life. And so it's been my prayer as a pastor and as a person just to pray for those who are hurting. As I watch the news, I watch it prayerfully. I don't watch it in a way that I can be fearful, so I watch it prayerfully. And this brings me to what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, if I could give it a title, the title would be The Removal of the Great Restraint the removal of the great restraint. What's happening in our world today is that there is a restraint. God has placed in this world a restraint today. And the restraint is keeping back or holding back all of the things that could happen. If we think the things are going on now are bad, can you imagine if the restraint wasn't there, if the guideline or God's will wasn't enforced? Can you imagine what the devil would do? He'd have free run and be able to do anything that he wanted to do to hurt people, to cause distraction and to cause destruction. So it's important for us to understand what this great restraint is. As I go over the scriptures, you'll be able to understand what this is. And I'm thankful to God that there is restraint in my life. There's restraint in my circle, in my influence because of God and the word and the Holy Spirit. And I'm giving you just a little bit of a secret of it. The Holy Spirit is the great restraint because once restraint, because once the Holy Spirit is removed, can you only imagine what might happen in this world today? So uh, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to be going down through verse 1 through 10. And again, I always ask you guys, please read these things for yourself. Don't just take anybody's word for it. We need to educate ourselves, become more aware of what the scriptures say. It's one thing for me to tell you, but it's another thing for you to get into the word for yourself and let the Holy Spirit speak to you yourself. I mean, it's more powerful. Yes, pastors tell you things and teachers tell you things, but when you get it for yourself in an intimate way, nobody can take it from you. So I want you to know that you know for yourself. So that's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 10. Now, I wrote some things down. I, I didn't ask a lot of questions this time, but I'm going to make some statements. And so I want you guys to think about this. Let's take a look at some of the key phrases and descriptions that we're going to find in this text that I'm going to be reading. And one of the first phrases we see is the coming of the Lord. You hear people talking about Jesus is coming all the time. And you'll find that this specifically talks about the coming of the Lord. And I think that's important for us to uh, have the mindset that Jesus is coming back. That's a helpful restraint right there. If I know that the Lord is coming back, then I'm going to live in a different kind of way. And my mindset's going to be different because I know he's coming. I want to be ready when he comes. And so and many Christians today are not thinking that Jesus is coming back. It's about their life here and now. And it's not about life here and now. So uh, the coming of the Lord is important. The number two thing is our gathering together with him. 
as we gather together with the Lord, you know, in the last of days, when he comes, we're going to be gathered together with him. You hear terms like that. Number three, the day of the Lord. That's another phrase we hear all the time, the day of the Lord. Uh, number four, the apostasy. You don't hear a lot about that in the church today, but there's a great apostasy. You know, everybody's looking for the world to come to an end. Well, one of the keys to the world coming to an end is that there shall be an apostasy. An apostasy just means a falling away from the faith or standing aloof from the things of God. And so unless there's a great apostasy, then the world is not going to come to an end. And so we read last time we were together about what's gonna really cause the world to come to an end is God himself. He's sovereign. No man can destroy this earth. And no matter how many rumors and, and wars and famines and all these things that we talk about and the fights and all that, nobody's gonna destroy it. You might damage it. You might cause a lot of death. You might cause a lot of despair. But until the gospel is preached throughout all the earth, then the end will come. See, the end comes when the gospel's preached. And so I think we focus on the wrong things. We're focused on the bad stuff. We focus on the problems. We're not focused on the solution. And the solution is that as a church, we need to be worried about preaching the gospel. And as we preach the gospel and get this message throughout the whole earth, then God, as, he, as being sovereign, will then sum up the time and he will bring Jesus back at the right and appointed time. So apostasy is huge. And I see apostasy happening now. I see a lot of people standing aloof from God and standing away from the church. And I understand why they do it, but that's one of the signs of the end of times. Uh, number five, the man of lawlessness. We keep talking about this antichrist, this uh, one world government and all these things of that nature. Yeah, it's going to happen. And the man of lawlessness, meaning this going to be the antichrist is going to show up on the scene and he's going to have answers and for all the world's problems. And there's seven years of tribulation that we hear of throughout the scriptures and three and a half good years and three and a half bad years. But he is referred to as the man of lawlessness. And so uh, there's nothing in him that's going to be good. One person asked me, what could it be a woman? I said, no, the Bible calls it a man of lawlessness. And so um, that's something we need to look to. And then the sixth thing is he who restrains. And I gave you a little bit of a tip that it's the Holy Spirit, he who restrains. And if it were not for the Holy Spirit restraining us today or restraining the world of evil today, then we would be in a really big problem. And so that's, that's something we got to consider. And the last thing is the activity of Satan. So this is what we're going to find in the stuff that I'm reading right now. And I just wanted to throw those out at you so when they pop up, you have some kind of context for it. So let's look at this. It's entitled The, uh, the, great, the Removal of the Great Restraint. And the subtitle here is Man of Lawlessness, meaning the reveal of the Antichrist. This is the reveal of the Antichrist. When the man of lawlessness is revealed, then we see the Antichrist. Some people say he's here already. I don't know. I can't tell you that, that he's here already. If he is, then he will show up soon. But I don't know that yet. But let's look at the scriptures and stick with what the scriptures have to say. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting with verse 1. It says this. Now we ask you, brethren and sisters, regarding the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gathering together with him. So this is the statement he's making, reminding them that Jesus is coming. And when Jesus comes, we are gathering, all right? Now, there's a lot talked about in the Bible uh, about the rapture. And we're going to deal with that in a minute as we go down a little further. But the word rapture is not found in the Bible. If I'm going to be scripturally and accurately correct, you will not find the word rapture in the Bible. But what you will find is some things that identify to a rapture or a catching away or us going going from here to there to be with the Lord, to be with him in the air. But the word rapture, if you're looking for the word rapture, don't argue with anybody. That word particularly is not in the Bible, but the evidence of it is all over the Bible, even in the Old Testament. All right. Now in verse two, that you be, that, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed, he says, either by a spirit or a message. And today there's a spirit and a message that's disturbing us today. And he says, don't be disturbed by that. Or a letter from us, listen, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Because some people believe that the day of the Lord has come. And I've heard people tell me that Jesus had already come, but that's not what the scriptures say. And so Paul just said, no spirit, no messenger, or no letter as though it came from the apostles themselves. He says, it's not so. Don't listen to it. Now look at verse three. No one is to deceive you in any way. And 
he is really big on us being deceived. And I think he makes this point because it's real easy to be deceived. It's real easy to be misled. And so he's telling us these things so we understand. This is why I said to you earlier, read the scripture for yourself. You may have a great man of God or a woman of God and people who know the word, but if you don't read it for yourself, you're never going to personally know. It's gonna be hearsay. It's gonna be what they said. It's what the pastor said. It's what my best friend said. It's what the theologian said. No, you gotta get it for yourself. Look at it with your own eyes, speak it with your own lips so you can hear it with your own ears. But he says here in three, he says, no one is to deceive you in any way for it will not come unless apostasy comes first. And then look at what it says. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Wow. So if we're looking for this antichrist personality to show up, well, the stage to set that is apostasy. In other words, as people are falling away from God, falling away from the church, it's a perfect time for this guy to show up with his one world government stuff, his one world religion, and his answers for everything. People will be crying, peace, peace. We finally have somebody who really knows what to do and humanity's okay. Well, humanity is never going to be okay unless we're okay with God. So understand that. So here's this guy going to show up, but apostasy must come first, which is the falling away from the faith, and then he will be revealed. And then the Bible refers to him as the son of destruction. And we got some pretty destructive personalities right now, but this guy is called the son of destruction. And see, and I won't mention any names about people who flaunt war and, and try to put fear on you about what they're gonna do and this whole talk about nuking everybody and we have nuclear war and all this stuff. You know, there's a guy coming that is called the son of destruction, which would give you some indication that we're not looking at a war to destroy us because this government, this antichrist has to come into play, to play. Once the antichrist comes into play, then the rest of things start to be unveiled and to be seen. So again, don't be deceived or be distracted by what you're seeing now on the news or on television. Look at what the word says. If apostasy starts happening, which I believe it has, we're set for the antichrist to show up on the scene who is the son of destruction. So know that until that happens, you, you don't have anything that what you hear on the news, it has any authentic truth to it. All right, number four. Now, he's the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God, lowercase g, or object of worship, because he's going to show up on the scene. He's going to exalt himself above what we know today as worship or what people worship today. He's going to be above that. He's going to raise himself above that. Who does that sound like? That sounds like Satan when he was in heaven with God. He wanted to be like the most high and he exalted himself above God. And he said, I will be like the most high. I will raise my throne above your throne. And the Bible says God kicked him out of heaven. So we have this same spirit that was kicked out of heaven, entering this person who's called the Antichrist or the son of destruction. It's same spirit. Now listen, verse four again, who opposes and exalts himself above every soul called God or object of worship so that he, listen, takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Now think about all the stuff that's happening right now, but this is what the Bible's saying. So the thing we should be looking for is what the Bible is saying. Don't be distracted by what the television and the news and the media is saying right now. When this begins to happen, now we're starting to see prophecy unfold. And so verse five, do not, he says, do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? He's remembering or having them remember what he's told them. And I, I feel bad today because in churches today, people haven't been reminded of these things. That's why I'm here today to remind you so we can put us back front and center to put our trust and our faith in God and not to put our fear in the world. And so Paul was saying to them, you know, I've told you these things before. Don't you remember? Now look at verse six. And you know, here, here goes the thing about restraint. And you know what restrains him now. What restrains who? What, what restrains the Antichrist? What restrains the devil? What restrains this destructive person in spirit? What restrains him now is what the Bible says. Look at verse six again. And you know what restrains him now so that he will be revealed in his time. So in other words, if he is here, he's not gonna be revealed because the Holy Spirit is still here. So the only way he's gonna be revealed is that 
the restraint of the Holy Spirit is removed, then he can be revealed. And one of the reasons why he can't be revealed at the time that the Holy Spirit is still sovereign in the believers in the church today is because the power of the Holy Spirit is resident in the church and the church has authority in the earth realm. So God would have to remove the church from all authority and power that was given to them through Jesus Christ to allow evil and things like that to have its full strength. And see, and so the Antichrist cannot come until the church is moved out. And this is what everybody thinks about the rapture. They go, oh, it's gonna be a rapture. And so once the church is taken out, then the enemy's gonna come, the evil one's gonna come. Well, again, there's a catching away. There's a gathering together, and that's what we refer to in the Bible as the rapture. And again, I say to you, the word rapture is not in the Bible, but signs of it is. Now, as the church is being removed, the Holy Spirit is in the church, the Holy Spirit is being removed, that means restraint is being removed. And once the restraint is removed, this is why we call him the man of lawlessness, because he does not have any law that he respects. He will be lawless, and so he'll do the things that he's been uh, derived to do. Now look at verse seven. It says, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So he's already got the state set because lawlessness is in the land now. That's what we see all this stuff going on, right? This is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's removed. And that's what I was saying. So the Holy Spirit is the only one that is able to stop or to restrain or to hold back the complete evil that they want to do. And so put your trust in God, put your trust in Jesus, trust the work of the Holy Spirit, because nothing's going to happen to us except God allows it for the sake of prophecy being fulfilled. And so there needs to be no fear. We need to trust him, have faith in him. So I, I'm going to read this part again, because this is so interesting. In verse seven, he says, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So we see it all around. And only he who now restrains will do so until he is removed. And so the Holy Spirit's job is to continue to restrain evil until it's time for him to be removed. And when it's time for the Holy Spirit to be removed, it will be the day of the Lord and the church will be caught up together with the Lord, which again, people refer to the rapture and will be with him in the air at that point. And so then lawlessness will take place. The great tribulation will take its course. And I'll tell you, it'll be uh, days like you've never imagined on the earth. Imagine a world without God in it, in the sense that, the gospel is being preached to you. People are praying for you. There's a place to go to worship. There's a place to go to study. It's a place to go to be comforted. Can you imagine all of that being removed? And then we have this religious government kind of church that really has no spirit of God in it, but it's more of an allegiance to the son of perdition, the man of destruction, the lawless one, one world government, one world religion, all of that kind of stuff, control. That's what you're going to have here. So it's, it's important for us to understand this now. Now look at verse eight as we're winding down. Verse eight, then the lawless one will be revealed. Remember, after everything is removed, after the Holy Spirit's been taken out, the church is gone. We don't know when that is. We just know this is what it says. So when the lawless one will be re re revealed, when the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will eliminate with the breath, listen, of his coming, the breath of his mouth, and bring to an end by his appearance of his coming. So when Jesus decides to show up, the Bible says when this lawlessness is in his work and he's doing what he's done, the breath of the Jesus's mouth, just a word that he speaks will destroy him. Just at Jesus's appearing will destroy or crumble the kingdom of the lawless one. So we don't ever have to worry about him having a reign too long, but Jesus will come at the right time. We don't know when that is though. We, God wouldn't tell us. He didn't tell the son, but Jesus would show up at the proper time. In verse nine, that is the one who's coming in accord with all the activity of Satan with power and false signs and wonders. And this gives us the other point. When the lawless one, lawless one shows up, he's going to show up with teachings, uh, false powers, things of that nature. He's got to gain the, the truth in some way, some form, influence the people. So he's got to let them know that he's got some power working. Now, remember in the beginning, 
when Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, the magicians had power too. Moses had power. So it was, again, the evil against good. It was Moses against the devil, again, in the same case. And so what you're going to see in these last days is a similar thing. And you're going to see God's work, and then you're going to see the enemy's work. And so this is why he said not to be deceived. And this is why I said to you not to look at the world and not to look at the news and not look at the stories that they tell you. Get into the word for yourself. Learn what the Bible says. See these events unfold. Apostasy comes first. Then the lawless one will be revealed. And then Jesus is going to remove the Holy Spirit from the earth. The church will be caught up with the Lord. We'll gather together with him. That's so simple. I mean, he makes it so plain. And it's less fear when you think of it like that. And then when Jesus decides to come and take over uh, the reign of the evil one, the Bible says that he's going to destroy him with his breath. In other words, he'll speak a word and he'll shatter the kingdom of the lawless one. Now look at uh, verse 9 again. He says, that is the one who's coming in accord with the activity of Satan. This is the lawless one. And with all power and false signs and wonders. Verse 10, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish. The deception and wickedness that he's going to use are for those who are perishing. And why do I say that? Because those who don't believe are perishing. For those of us who do believe, we won't be here. We won't be here during that time. We will be caught away, gathered together with the Lord. And those who will remain and be left here because they didn't believe, they are going to be deceived. I mean, who wouldn't want a one world religion when it placates everything that you want? Who wouldn't want all your needs met? Because this is what it's gonna seem like. This guy's gonna have answers for everything. The world's problems will seem to be solved. And so he's gonna deceive a lot of people. So look at verse uh, 10 again. It says, and with all deception and wickedness, for those who perish because they did not accept the love of the truth, wow, so as to be saved. Because you didn't accept it, or I didn't accept it, or they didn't accept it, we will perish. God is, let me say this, God is not doing anything to anybody. He's not destroying people. He's not counting people out. He's loving people. But because we would not receive the love of the truth, this is why we're going to be deceived. A lot of people say, well, God's sending people to hell. If he's a loving God, why would he do that? Well, you've just seen it right here in Scripture. Uh, and with all deception and wickedness for those who perish because they did not accept the love of the truth so as to be saved. It's a decision that you had to make yourself. So that's so important for us to know that in these last days, and here's this last thing I want to make this statement here. Here's a note that I wrote down. To clarify the term referring to rapture, has been derived from the phrase gathering together with Christ. That's where it comes from. So in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17, it says this. This is a reference for you to go back and look at for yourself. Verse 17 of chapter 4. Then we who are alive, who remain, will be caught up together. See, that word caught up means to be raptured, but the word rapture is not there. So it's the idea of being caught up. Enoch was caught up. Elijah was caught up, right? You know, uh, you see this all over the Bible. Jesus was caught up, and the Bible says he went up into the clouds. And so we see all of that happening. Elijah was caught up. And so this thing has been around for a long time. So when we say caught up, what we're referring to is the rapture. When we say rapture, we're referring to being caught up. And so right here in verse 17 again, so you get it. Then we who are alive, in other words, still alive on the earth before everything starts to happen, who remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will we always be with the Lord. So that's a promise he makes in that sense that once we meet the Lord and gather together with him, we'll never be separated from him again. But there are many other events that will happen during that time. You remember, we still got the thousand year rule of Christ, the perfect government, the millennial rule. It's called the millennial rule of Christ in the earth. And he's going to rule for a thousand years. So all of that is happening and so much is happening. And I know I shared a lot with you today, but this is why I ask you to go back and read it for yourself and ask God for clarity to make sense of it for you so that you will know that you know Know what the word says about these last days. And that's what I have for you today in Jesus' name.